G'day ladies and gents, as most of you know, I have two boats that I fish out of. One's a seven metre Riptide plate alloy vessel. That does a lot of my big offshore trips, particularly the overnighters, etc., up north. Uh, and also use a five metre centre console uh, for doing a lot of my estuary, bay, and light offshore work. Now, I've been wanting to upgrade that small boat for quite some time. Uh, I looked at getting one built now. Unfortunately, the wait times were huge, so I've had to go second hand. Been looking for 12 months, struggling to find something that I could see myself doing up or was a suitable candidate just to use how it was. I found something at John Crawford Marine, funny enough, um, and I thought this would be a good opportunity to give these guys a huge shout out. Credit given where credit due. This was an unbelievable experience and I know others have had the same through these guys. They haven't asked me to do it. There was no deals done. They don't even know I'm doing it. So um, I just think when you get good service like that, give them a push because uh, it was really good. Now what made these guys good was the effort they put in to make it a seamless transition. And not only that, but the thorough checks that go into the boats. So this is what I ended up with. A five metre centre console. It's an offshore marine master. It's a great canvas. Now it's not exactly what I wanted, but I think it's a, it's a great platform to do everything that I need to it to make it an absolute fishing weapon. It is foam filled. So when I took this thing for a test run, it was dead quiet in the water and it performed unreal. Soft ride, and funny enough, Eric that does all of the uh, testing here, the boat test, he said it was one of the best performing little boats he's ever been in. The only downside, it's only got a 70 Suzuki four stroke. So I feel it's a little bit underpowered. During the test, it was fine. But I think once I load it with gear, do an offshore trip, definitely underpowered. Uh, it's probably working a little harder than it needs to. So I'm gonna throw a brand new 115 Suzuki on it. Uh, the guys at Bayside Suzuki will get that on soon. Casting platform, I think I'll raise it up a bit higher, uh, get a little bit more storage, get it how I want. A new electric on the front, rip this wrap off. It's not my cup of tea one little bit. So whether I put a new wrap on or possibly just leave it aluminium because it's gonna get a fair amount of use. Alloy trailer, I've got a Riptide alloy trailer so that I've currently put under my small boat. It's gonna go under this boat. Just make it how I want. Turn it into an absolute little fishing weapon that'll do estuary, bay, and pretty big offshore trips as well. So good fuel capacity. This thing's gonna be a little weapon, but just wanted to give these guys a huge shout out just to the pre-inspection, the whole level of service blew me away. You know, things that weren't working in this boat, that weren't happy with the trailer, uh, VHF wasn't working, deck wash wasn't working, well, they fix all that for you. They make sure that absolutely everything in these boats work before it comes out of here. So a huge shout out to uh, Matt, Jim and Eric. Your level of service blew me away, hence this video. Thank you guys. And to everyone else, stay tuned. I'm gonna turn this thing into an absolute little weapon. As soon as I got the boat home, I started removing the wrap with the heat gun. It took a considerable amount of heat and time to remove it, but after lots of patience, I finally got the job done. Unfortunately, it left a thick film of sticky glue on the sides, and after trying every product under the sun to remove it, I found the only thing that worked was a couple coats of paint stripper and a gurney to blast it off. The next task was to begin the fabrication work at Riptide Alloy Boats, where the boys would modify my current Riptide trailer to suit this boat and begin the long list of additions and modifications to transform this boat. The trailer skids were cut off and new ones lengthened to suit the deeper V of this hull. The winch post was also removed, shortened, and we fitted a boat catch for easy launching and retrieving when fishing solo. This also meant a ladder was required so I could get on and off the boat, so Stu quickly made one up to suit the limited space we had. The next job was to remove the current Bowman electric bracket, which was unfortunately in the wrong position. The new 72 inch long Minkota restricted access to get around the console and would also be in the way of the new casting deck lid. The lads made up a new one and positioned it in the correct location to ensure the head and shaft of the electric was over the gunnel and completely out of the way. Next was to enclose the inside of the transom where the batteries and other components were located. This would get them out of the weather and neaten up the inside transom area. An alloy sheet was cut and folded to suit before being welded into position. The holes were cut to suit two large hatches, allowing for full access into each compartment. Back up the front of the boat, we remove the old casting deck and begin to make plans for the new and improved one. This would be the most challenging modification of the boat due to many factors that came into play, and also for one of the purposes that it was being built for. All right, next big step for this boat is building a quite a large casting deck. Uh, we removed the, the semi sort of half-heighted one that was in there. And we're going to extend a fair way back to the console. We're going to make it to the height of the gunnel so it gives it a massive casting area. I'll show you why we're doing that later on. It's pretty cool. For a five metre boat, it's 
probably borderline, almost unachievable what we're trying to do here. I think we might just get away with it. So cut the old casting deck out, left a little bit where the anchor well was. We've managed to use the anchor that was with the boat and modify it so it sits down nicely into it. We've actually put a slit into this, some supports each side of it. Another support down the bottom there. This will come straight out and the anchor can come straight back out. Like that. Holds it nicely in place. Can't move around. Anchor chain, everything go in there. Plenty of room for it all. So support here. So that'll be the basically the anchor hatch here. That'll be one massive hatch we're trying to achieve here. Gas struts. And it will just lift up the full access to all this. The channels or the gutters that will come off here. So when it get any water on the deck or rain, they'll, they'll run off into those channels along and out back into the boat. The boys are just making them up now. So it's one of them days just fold it up there. So they'll get welded on the side. And then the top sheet of the casting deck will then be folded up and sit so that any of the water comes on the deck, runs off into here, down the channel, and out through the boat. That's the boys over there. Actually hand making all these channels now. Due to the condition and low height of the windscreen and frame, I decided to remove both of them to make way for a larger and more practical windscreen. We also plated and squared up the front of the console to make it easier for the new windscreen and also the casting platform and channels. Dave then made up some steps to get up onto the casting deck by bending some tube and also welding some checker plate on the top. Next up, Dave and Tony begin the tedious process of making up the large casting deck lid and begin making a series of precision folds to ensure the gaps were perfectly spaced between the lid and the channels. After lots of searching, I managed to find some heavy duty aluminium piano hinge for the lid. By turning the hinge upside down and welding it into place, you avoid having a large hinge that extrudes through the deck and you end up with no join or very little join in the deck covering depending on what you choose to put down. Bracing for the lid is folded up and welded into place to ensure that it's light but yet strong enough to handle the weight of multiple people standing on it. With majority of the fabrication work completed on the casting deck, I had Gas Strut Repairs Brisbane come out to Riptide and let us know where to weld the mounting points for the large stainless steel strut. He then gassed it on site to suit the weight and height of the lid before installing it. We also made up some mounts for a casting deck leaning post and welded them into place. To neaten up the appearance underneath the casting deck, I decided to completely line the entire area with a marine cabin liner which was a fiddly process but well worth it in the end. We removed the old crappy telescopic ladder and Stewie bent up some tubing to make a new and improved one to suit the transom.
We then designed a new battery box to house two of the slimline 100 amp revolution lithium batteries which would be mounted on the inside of the console and out of the way. Being so compact and only weighing in just over 11 kilograms each, this was the perfect location to keep the boat well balanced without sacrificing valuable space under the casting deck area. With the boat having some minor surface corrosion from the salt water, I spent six days sanding the entire boat inside and out. This would include grinding and die grinding some welds throughout the entire boat to neaten the overall appearance without weakening the welds. This was a slow and tedious process with several different techniques and tools required to smooth out joints before I hand sanded the gunnels, gunnel capping, bow rails, windscreen framing and chine capping to give it a brushed aluminium look. To protect and seal the aluminium I coated everything other than the side sheets with a product called Nialic, which is often pronounced as Nialic. This thin coating is widely used in many industries such as the marine, mining, aviation and more. With one litre said to cover up to 30 square metres, I begin to put on a generous coat with a small foam roller whilst using a small brush to coat the joins and hard to reach places. Although Nialic is super thin, you can continue to work the area back and forth to spread it evenly and flatten out any areas that run. As the Nialic dries, it flattens out giving a nice clear shiny protective coating that's said to last anywhere from 3 to 10 years. A big thanks to Jeff from Nialic Australia for all his great advice and awesome customer service. With Batesai Suzuki removing the old outboard, I took the boat back to Riptide to have the outboard transom height raised and strengthened to suit the new 25 inch extra long shaft 115 Suzuki. While we were at it, we removed the old transducer brackets and made some much larger ones to give me better transducer placement options for multiple transducers. Once finished again, I sanded back the entire transom area and applied the Nialic clear coating. Next, we modified the old seat box and made a new backrest out of 40mm alloy tubing. I then spent many hours sanding the frame and seat box before coating them in the Nialic clear coating. I then had Brendan Watts from Southside Marine Trimming, who happens to do riptides and many other builders upholstery, retrim the seat base and made up a new backrest. They turned out great and a big thanks to Brendan for the super fast turnaround during a very busy period. Moving on to the dash, I purchased some 6mm matte black acrylic to use as a fascia. Instead of cutting the sheet into two pieces for the different angles on the dash, I decided to use a heat gun and bend the acrylic to the shape of the console. After bending it slightly as a reference, I removed the sheet and wasted many hours making a jig trying to bend the acrylic into the correct shape with more heat than I could ever have imagined. After finally getting it right, I glued the panel to the dash with some Sikaflex and cut the holes for the steering helm, VHF, outboard control box and Suzuki digital gauge before taking the boat to Bayside Suzuki Marine for its new outboard fitment. Although this is a big 5 metre boat, we felt the new 2 litre DF-115B would be a great match in delivering more than enough power while giving exceptional fuel economy with its lean burn technology. This was an important element to get right on this boat and with its fuel tank capacity being 103 litres, I had high hopes of achieving fuel figures over 2.5 kilometres a litre to ensure it had a decent range. Outboard testing will be in the final part 2 episode and from what I'm told this outboard may deliver some mind blowing fuel economy numbers well beyond my expectations. The team fitted the outboard, the control box, digital gauge and new wiring harness in no time at all before running the motor to ensure all was working well ready for pickup. G'day guys, quick update where we're up to with this project. So we are week six into it. Uh, it's taking a little bit longer than I anticipated but we've done probably three times, four times more than I originally had planned. So we are getting there. Big thanks to Bayside Suzuki for throwing the Suzuki on yesterday. Uh, I know they have absolutely flat straps, so they've got a lot of work on. They're booked out for a few months as far as fitting outboards, full electrical work on a lot of the big boats. So um, thanks, guys, for fitting that in. Today, it's all about the electrical side of, on this boat. So I've got Scott Haradine from Ocean Logic. Uh, he's coming to wire this up. The best part about that, it's my son, Sam, works for him. He's a second-year apprentice for Scott. So the boys have given up their weekend to come work on it. And uh, we're in my mate Brett Sang's shed. So big thanks to Brett 
it's absolutely scorching hot at the moment. So I have bought the boat here. It's got an open garage at the front and back. So let a nice bit of air flow through for the boys, make it a bit more comfortable from the work on this boat. But uh, we have a full rewire done on this boat as well as a lithium setup as well. So let's have a Revolution Power Solutions lithium setup going to this boat. Big thanks to Dave Nielsen from Revolution. Spoke to Dave. He designed a package for this boat just like that. If you want anything over the top, it's only a five meter boat, but also sufficient to do big trips and have enough power. So everything will run off the lithium other than the outboard. Still got AGMs for the start batteries, um, but everything else as far as the house goes will run all the other components. So a uh, very cool system. I'll show you a bit more of that when we get the boat going. But looking forward to getting this boat fully wired, lithium setup done, and uh, hopefully on the water in the next two weeks. We'll see how we go. Still lots to be done, but fingers crossed, be on the water soon. With Scott mounting all the lithium battery components to a plate I had welded underneath the console, he began the timely process of cutting, crimping, heat shrinking and labelling all the cables with the help from Brett and Sam. I took this as a good time to start fitting the boat out with things like the electric, deck wash, nav lights, rod holders and access hatches before calling it a weekend. Don't miss the next part 2 final episode as the boat gets finished off with a wrap, windscreen, electronics, floor covering and more before hitting the water for some testing. I also reveal some wicked ideas and features making this the ultimate all-round 5 meter boat.